Hey everyone, welcome to week 42. This is day three, Wednesday. This is our unfamiliar week. So on Monday, we painted Danny, a weird angle, you know, uh, chin up high, uh, kind of turning away from us, and then like a mass of hair to the uh, left side of the painting. Very strange composition, but very, very nice. Uh, yesterday, we painted a foreshortened uh, hand, and that was very, very cool. And today we're gonna to use lighting to see things that are familiar to us in unfamiliar ways. So let's see how we do. Okay, let's get started. This is day three. This is our third day on our unfamiliar week. Remember, what we're trying to do is try to convince ourselves that instead of understanding things as being difficult to uh, depict through painting to interpret through painting what we're doing is almost accepting that we are just not familiar with them it may be a subject matter that we've come in contact with for a long time it may have been that we have painted that same subject matter many many times but what happens is that that subject matter is being presented to us in a way that we've never seen it before and because we have never seen it before, and because this would feel like the first time we're actually seeing it, we deem it as difficult to understand. We convince ourselves that this is going to be very hard to paint. When in reality, all it speaks about is that there are so many ways of presenting a same form, a same shape, which, you know, ends up being the subject matter of our painting. But there are so many ways of nature presenting those at some point familiar shapes to us in such different ways that even though it is kind of scary at first to accept that this is simply just another viewpoint, this is just seeing something from another shore, we actually have to make an effort to try and get used to that feeling. I mean, this doesn't mean we're never going to be surprised. This doesn't mean that nature is not going to be awe-inspiring all of a sudden just because we predict all the myriad of ways in which it can actually surprise us. No, this is an acknowledgement of the infinite ways that we can experience nature. And it's not so much as anticipating those ways as it is telling ourselves, yeah, I have to be ready when this happens. And how do I get ready? Well, the easiest thing for us painters is not to fall onto the trap of constantly painting not only the same subject matter, but of repeating the same exercise over and over and over again. Many, many times our paintings may be a little bit different in terms of subject matter, but they end up being the same painting, but we end up resolving it in the same way. And maybe it has to do with, you know, the type of light that we like, the direction of light that we like. Maybe it has to do with the palette that we like, with the compositional devices that we use. So it's always good, I feel, if we make ourselves uncomfortable from time to time, it's not bad to have like those small triumphs while painting, going back to those paintings that we know move us and that we know we can solve. I totally understand why that's fine because the act of painting has a way of making us understand how little we know that it's inherently very humbling. So if we can give ourselves those little wins, those tiny little wins, from time to time, those can keep us going. Those are very helpful and I would say very healthy in a way. So it's not bad to do the painting that you know you like to do, to just go back to Old Faithful and say, yeah, this I know how to paint. I wanna have that really nice painting experience. That's totally cool. But we can't just stay there because that can also be numbing. And if we stay there, we're gonna convince ourselves that we're very good at painting when in reality, we're very good at painting just one tiny little thing and we're good at repeating that one tiny little thing. Painting should never feel comfortable. Now, I know this sounds weird. What is this masochistic act where you want to suffer constantly? But it's not so much about suffering as it is about learning. And I think that as much as an experience can take a toll on us and be mentally and physically exhausting and you can be emotional by the end as much as that can be part of the painting act when you step back and you realize how much you've learned with every single painting you've done that was worth it that was absolutely worth it I'm willing to make all those sacrifices 
for the sake of learning. So this week speaks about that, about tackling the unfamiliar, but it's doing it in a way where the payoff is incredible, is immeasurable. You know, the most invaluable thing that we can ask of painting is that it teaches us something every single day. And I think that this does that, you know, an exercise like this keeps us on our toes. It pushes us constantly. It makes you feel uncomfortable, but a good sort of uncomfortable. So on Monday, we did this really nice angle of uh, Danny's portrait where honestly, I just had a blast painting her ear. It's almost like the portrait was a pretext to paint an ear, to have an awesome time just painting this ear in this really strange angle where it was exhibiting all of its structure and all of its glory. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I was speaking of yesterday how that pose, that angle was a sort of homage to uh, Dermot Kelly. Uh, Dermot Kelly to me, and I expressed this yesterday, he is one of the best contemporary painters. I mean, he is just a delicious painter. That sounds a little weird, but honestly, when I see his paintings, that's all I think about. It's like, oh my God, I can taste those paintings. They are so, so good. So on Monday, we had a weird angle for Danny's head. And on Tuesday, I pushed myself to do my foreshortened left hand. And I had a blast doing it. And this is the cool part. This is where we're going to attempt to start to connect these things. So when I thought about that hand and when I thought about that head, that particular head, I immediately went to a detail of a Lermite painting. I've talked about him before and Lermite was one of the most amazing late 19th century uh, French painters. Incredible painter. I mean, if you like form, if you like structure, I think that Lermite has to be one of those, you know, top 10 painters in all of time because he completely understood how to display all the three-dimensional nature of form in the most sensible of ways. To me, he's just amazing. But I'm bringing him up. I'm bringing up Lermite because when I was younger, and I think I told you guys this story, but when I was younger, I remember I was horrified of painting hands. And I would just do very simple poses with the hands and at the time, I was looking at uh, a book on Lermite, and I suddenly saw that all of his paintings, I mean, I'm probably generalizing a little bit, but a lot of his paintings have to do with hands, you know, in the same sense that that Guercino Samson painting was about this intersection of hands. Um, a lot of Lermite's paintings acknowledge the fact that hands are vehicles of expression, and he does just the most incredible hands. I've been lucky enough to see a couple of his paintings in real life, and they're incredible. And I remember just getting that feeling when I saw them from life also, where hands were these powerful tools. And it makes sense with the sort of socialist, realist manner in which he painted, just to see the hands of the people as working hands and, and to pay so much attention to the hands. But I was blown away. And I remember that after seeing his work, I literally told myself, like, this was a turning point, I think, in my life. And specifically regarding hands, the treatment of hands, I told myself, stop running away. Stop avoiding painting hands. Don't just be content with doing nice, regular hands. Push yourself. Try to paint them in weird ways and give them a ton of expression if you can. Just don't run away. Tackle the problem head on. I wish that it was just about that. I wish it was just about convincing ourselves that that's all we need, like a good attitude and just go get him and that's it. And then suddenly the next day you're painting these incredible hands. I would say not quite. I mean, we, we still have to paint them. We can have a great attitude, but we still have to paint them. But there's something to be said about a mindset. There's something to be said about convincing yourself that you're not going to be defeated even before painting something and that what you're going to do is just give it a shot and and not just give it a shot like push yourself to like try and hit it out of the park every single time i love the fact that a work of art that a painting in this case doesn't remain as a painting you know it doesn't have to be static as a painting it actually becomes a catalyst for something and for me it was about pushing he was a reminder of pointing out that I was missing so much, so, so much by avoiding something that I had deemed to be too difficult for me. By the way, and this is where we connect stuff, I saw this one drawing of L'Hermite, and it's a lovely drawing. It's an absolutely beautiful drawing. 
But the coolest thing was that it reminded me of an illustrator that I absolutely loved when I was in school. His name is F.R. Gruger. And Gruger would solve his illustrations with, I think it was a carbon pencil. I think it was a wolf pencil, maybe, and washes sometimes. So wolf pencil and wash. But Gruger is one of those remarkable draftspeople in history. I, I tend to say this with a lot of illustrators, but in Gruger's case, he didn't paint. He just solved stuff through drawing. And in doing so, drawing became, you know, in his hand, this amazing tool. And I guess that Lermite drawing gave me a little bit of uh, Gruger vibes. And while I was looking at Gruger's work, and I have to check this, because I, I remember looking at his work at the Illustration House in New York, and I remember talking to Walt Reed about him a little bit. And there was this thing that was always said about Gruger. He worked from imagination, which blows my mind. I mean, if that is the truth, it just absolutely blows my mind. Those are some of the things that I can't fit into my brain. And if it is so, what an extraordinary human being. What a gift of the universe just to see somebody like that work. I think he's remarkable. I think, uh, for example, Ian McCaig has a little bit of his drawing in him. I think uh, Wesley Burt has a little bit of uh, Gruger's drawing in him also. So there are some ripples, uh, you know, through history, through the history of illustration that extend to, you know, more contemporary illustrators. Gruger was amazing. And I landed on these couple of drawings where I realized that he was not only using his ability to uh, portray form, uh, but he was also using light to actually tell a story. And that was very traditional and expected for an illustrator at the time. But I was reminded of what is happening today with the painting from today where light is actually part of the story. Light is not just meant to be this external device that enables us to present the three-dimensionality of form in a very particular way. Light actually tells a story. It creates masses of light, masses of shadow that can in turn become compositional designs. So the extent of how light can affect the way we read an image is enormous. And I thought about the character of light for today's painting and I think that that's exactly what's happening. This, by the way, you know how we speak about found objects in art? This is like a found light. I wish I could say that I placed this bottle, you know, right in that spot and I turned on the uh, bathroom light in my mother's house, which is actually the light source in the background. And then I tried to look at this sort of backlit bottle with some of the light kind of seeping through its plastic. But no, this was not by design. This was just nature sitting there. Uh, I have to say this, one of the things that I enjoy the most about painting is not just reorganizing nature. I'm really bad actually at composing, let's say, a still life. I, I can get into that mindset where I can do a very traditional effort in constructing like this big choreography of shapes that is going to end up being a still life. But I actually love finding them in nature. I actually feel far more comfortable when I'm looking around and I'm trying to find moments in nature that have been, in a way, untouched. These are not artificial moments. These are just haphazard ways in which objects have been placed. And I feel that it is my job to just find those moments, to scavenge for those moments. Those are like little gems that I find in nature. So I found this moment and I was like, yeah, I need to paint this. This is fantastic lighting. It looks so ominous. It looks so 2020. This bottle that has alcohol in it. If I've ever seen a spray bottle that can speak about 2020, it had to be this one. So I, immediately I was like, yeah, I got to paint this. I have to paint this. And I have to paint it, again, as threatening, as menacing as I can and make it seem like it's bigger than it is and make it seem like its presence is actually far greater, far grander than it just being this simple, again, plastic spray bottle that is just lying there in my mother's house. So for the last couple of days, Monday and Tuesday, we were using form or we were turning form better. Um, at angles where we would encounter shapes that were once familiar to us and we would see them in an unfamiliar way. This was a non-conventional way of looking at both Danny's portrait, you know, that contour, that ear, and my hand with that foreshortening. 
And today, it was not so much about form. Form remains very static. We can actually think of this uh, spray bottle, of this spritzer bottle, as a profile almost. But the variable that's actually taking center stage in this painting is light. This is a condition of light that feels so specific. It almost feels theatrical in a way, as if this was a condition that was set up to portray this bottle. And it gives it the ability to prompt this very specific emotional response in us. The truth is, again, I just found it. I just found this condition, but I, I was looking for it. I'm always looking for those moments. So as soon as I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's it. That's my painting. So that was it for today. Last two days, it was about form. Today, it is about lighting. And that's just a reminder that there's no one way that we can understand as the way, the thing that we can change in order to start perceiving things a little bit different. No, there's tons and tons of ways to do this exercise. This is just an invitation for you guys to do the same thing and to discover the so many ways in which nature can represent itself uh, to us. So that was it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Join us tomorrow where we speak a little bit about, um, let's say, time and maybe uh, neglect. That sounds a bit harsh, but uh, I'll leave you guys with that. Uh, so I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.